All right, well, let's get started. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, my name is Matt Charlin from Charlin Brock Architects. Uh, joined today with Mike Bazanz uh, from Colliers. Mike serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Colliers Mortgages FHA Lending Program. In this role, Mike is responsible for all operational aspects of the firm's FHA lending business. Prior to holding this role, Mike served as head of, F of FHA underwriting. Mike has over 13 years of commercial and mortgage banking experience in production, underwriting, processing, and asset management. Prior to joining Doherty Mortgage, now Collier's Mortgage, in November of 2010, Mike worked as an asset manager for a family-owned development and management firm where he was responsible for the company's portfolio of apartments, condominiums, and townhomes. Um, so we're, we're all gathered here today to, to discuss and figure out how to unlock this capital. Um, you know, it's been a challenging market uh, financially, uh, not knowing exactly how the Fed is going to uh, to instruct interest rate policy going forward. They've they said that they're going to be uh, dovish uh, in the in the coming years, but kind of with a, a bearish tinge to it uh, in the immediate future. So um, with with all of that, you know, HUD is is uh, in a very strong position to invest in housing, which whether it be affordable or market rate benefits all of housing. And so we want to talk today about how to make the process less painful. You know, this idea of, of the HUD that we all uh, got used to 10 years ago, five years ago, even three years ago, is not the same HUD uh, in 2024. So with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Mike. Great, thanks Matt and good afternoon or good morning everybody. Um, I, I want to thank Matt, uh, David, and the whole team at Charlotte Brock for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you today. Uh, I'm really ex excited to talk about HUD financing. I know for for some people that's kind of an oxymoron, but uh, you know, really, I'm very passionate about HUD financing. Um, I think it's a, a very a very great option in all markets, but but particularly. Um, in today's market, um, where we continue to see news stories and and hear anecdotes and and see firsthand uh, the challenges of obtaining financing for new construction, and you know the the FHA HUD programs are are there to provide liquidity um, in all markets um, at all times, and in, including the market we're currently in. And so you know HUD is there, HUD is available, and HUD is lending. And so. What I want to talk about today is um, the new construction programs, um, some of the process that goes along with it, how we can make that process easier for everybody, sort of what is and, and what is not um, involved with HUD financing, and then talk a little bit about the, the acquisition and refinance options with HUD as well in the event you've already got a, a project financed and under construction. Um, so uh, with that, we'll we'll get started. I'll skip the first slide here since Matt did a very nice introduction. Um, and just a few words about Collier's Mortgage Holdings here, which is the group um, that I'm part of. Um, we've been around since 1977. Um, as Matt indicated, we we're formerly on the Doherty Financial Group, which is more of a regional investment bank. Um, and uh, in June of 2020, we partnered with Colliers, which is a you know very exciting for us. Um, increased our nat our national presence um, through a, a handful of companies under Colliers Mortgage Holdings. We provide a, a variety of financing. So uh, through Colliers Mortgage and Colliers Funding, is our our primary vehicles for financing commercial real estate. Um, we also have a securities broker dealer, Colliers Securities. Um, that will underwrite and sell tax exempt bonds for for housing projects, infrastructure projects, healthcare, um, other asset types. So then we have an insurance agency as well, um, Collier's Insurance, that uh, also operates out of here in Minneapolis. That um, is very competitive in providing property casualty insurance um, as well as builders risk, which has been a big part of our market in the past few years. Um, <clears throat> So moving forward, Collier's Mortgage is, um, we are an agency lender. So we we uh, we are a licensed lender under the Fannie Mae Dust program. Um, we are a FHA MAP lender and lien lender. So that means we can provide mortgages under the multifamily and healthcare and hospital programs. Um, and then we're also a USDA approved lender. So we can provide financing under the 1RD program for community facilities, 
as well as the uh, 538 Guaranteed Rural Rental Housing Program. Um, and then uh, through, uh, through Collier's Mortgage, we also provide um, you know, life insurance company financing, pension funds, banks, CMBS. Um, so a lot of options under our platform other than HUD, um, but we're going to focus on we're going to focus on HUD today. Um, and and HUD really provides a, a variety of loan types. Um, HUD will provide new construction financing. Um, they'll provide financing for substantial rehabs, um, and that includes both a rehab of an of an existing multifamily property or a conversion of another type of housing into multifamily. So adaptive reuse of, of office buildings, which we're hearing a lot about lately, um, or you know historic mills and other historic property types. We've seen all of that. Um, refinance and acquisition, um, moderate rehab, uh, reposition, um, and then low-income housing tax credit projects as well. We see a lot of acquisition rehabs under the tax credit program. Um, Collier's Mortgage has historically, um, and in the past few years especially, been a top 10 lender under the HUD new construction programs. Um, and so we are very active in the 221D4 space um, and very knowledgeable and experienced in that program. Um, there are some very significant advantages generally to HUD loans, um, as, as most of you likely know. Um, HUD is one of the few options in the market that provides long-term fixed rate fully amortizing financing. Um, and, and in addition to that, they provide up to the highest leverage. Um, so depending on your property type, HUD will finance up to 90% of cost and go down to a 111 coverage. Um, for most market rate projects, um, we're in the 85% of cost, um, 118 debt service coverage ratio, but that's still higher. Um, or, or uh, higher leverage than you're gonna see from other financing sources. Um, additionally, HUD provides some of the lowest interest rates in the market. Um, and they do that because the federal mortgage insurance that's provided through the programs allows the loans to be securitized as Ginnie Mae securities on the secondary market. And the Ginnie Mae security has the full faith and credit of the United States government. And so it trades at a much lower spread over a 10 year treasury than um, than another asset type. So um, we've got long-term fixed rate, high leverage, fully amortizing. Um, also have flexible prepayment options. Um, typical structure on a HUD loan is a, is a step-down prepayment. So um, you, you would have uh, a typical structure would be 10% of unpaid principal balance in the first year, nine in the second, eight in the third, and so on. And so what that creates is predictability um, with respect to your prepayment penalty. Um, you don't have to rely on a yield maintenance or defeasance calculation that varies based on the market. Um, very important in today's market, um, HUD loans are non-recourse. Um, and so aside from signing a, a, a carve out for, for fraud or, or other, or other um, misappropriation of funds, um, HUD loans are non-recourse. So the lender is not going after um, your other assets, and that includes construction loans as well. There, there are not many non-recourse construction options out there, um, and the loans are also fully assumable. So a lot of really great benefits there. Um, the HUD programs are, are named after sections of the National Housing Act of 1937, and so um, you sort of have a, a, a number and alphabet soup of programs, but um, the, pro the main programs are the 221-D4, which is new construction or substantial rehab, 223-F, which is a refinance of an existing apartment building, um, and then you have 223-A7, which is the refinance of an existing HUD-insured mortgage, um, and then there are some other lesser-used programs as well. Today, we're going to focus on the D4 and the F programs. And so here we go. We have a, a a good amount of information, which I know is a bit small, and and uh, you know the presentation will be made available. But here are some general terms for the two twenty one D four program. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a fully amortizing loan, but most importantly, it's a drawdown construction loan that converts to a fully amortizing loan. So you have a drawdown interest only loan for your construction period. Um, plus two months, at which point converts to a permanent loan without a conversion or a re-underwriting test. And so 
you know, unlike a, a forward or a bank execution that that maybe have has a mini perm component, there is not a performance or operations test to convert that loan to a permanent loan. So it takes out the refinance risk that might be associated with another type of financing. Um, and so you lock the interest rate on both the construction portion and the permanent portion um, at the closing of the construction loan. So you also take out the interest rate risk during the construction period. Um, HUD will finance up to 85% of your mortgage eligible cost and more relevant in today's market will underwrite a debt service coverage of 1.1765 or 1.18 rounded up. Um, in today's rate market, most loans are constrained by debt service coverage ratio. Um, and, and what that translates to um, on our most recent transactions has been a loan amount that's somewhere between 75 and 85% of project costs. So higher than the sort of 60 to 65 you might be seeing from, from other sources that, that, that lower debt service coverage helps fill that financing gap. Um, we, we talked about uh, lockout terms, prepayment terms, um, the, the recourse and the escrows. Um, one component of the HUD loan is uh, the mortgage insurance premium. And, that, and that's part of how, how the rates are able to be kept low. And so HUD does charge a mortgage insurance premium that is, that is not part of the interest rate, but paid annually, similar to a tax and insurance escrow. Um, and when we're talking about new construction, most new construction projects take advantage of the green MIP, which we'll get into later in the presentation, but that is 25 basis points annually. Um, and then the process is about 10 to 12 months from start to finish, and we'll get into the process uh, fairly detailed as we move forward. So key items to success in the 221D4 program, which is for new construction and sub rehab. Um, and experience is the biggest one. Um, HUD wants to work with people that have developed multifamily apartments in the past. So not necessarily HUD experience, but experience with the product type that you're building. So um, if you are an experienced developer, um, that goes a long way with HUD, even if you don't have previous HUD experience. Um, and if you maybe don't have that multifamily experience, bringing in a development partner or a consultant to help meet that experience requirement is acceptable and something we've seen um, be successful in a lot of cases. But it's not just you as the developer that, that makes a difference, it's the entire team. And so the team includes the architect, the contractor, and the management agent. Um, and particularly throughout the application process, it's the architect and the contractor. Um, the HUD process is driven very heavily by um, the architecture and cost review and the design timeline. So having, having a team on the design side that is familiar with the HUD requirements and experienced in designing multifamily is gonna make that process a lot easier for you um, because they're gonna know what's required of the plans and specs. They're gonna know the formatting, they're gonna know the deliverables, the stages of completeness, and they're going to be able to work with you and your lender to come up with a with a timeline and a, a project schedule that that everybody can work towards um, and deadlines that everybody can meet, which is really important in, in staying on track and and getting to closing in a, in a 10 to 12 month time frame. Um, fully designed plans and specs are a big por big component of the HUD program. So. HUD doesn't allow a design build project. They do want your project fully designed. And so again, that's where a, that's where a design team comes in. Um, on the construction side, HUD does require Davis-Bacon wage rates to be paid. And so having a contractor that, that is either familiar with and has used Davis-Bacon before, um, or has the, the back office support needed to um, needed to do the wage compliance is important. And so working with a working with a sophisticated and well-capitalized contractor makes a difference. And then again, non-recourse for the life of the loan. So HUD is not making you as the developer sign any sort of completion guarantee, um, which is which is very significant in today's market. And instead, the HUD relies on the contractor's ability to provide a payment and performance bond, um, essentially as the completion guarantee. 
Um, and the cost of that is a mortgage eligible cost. And so again, working with a contractor that's able to provide those bonds um, and has that experience is, is very important. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the HUD process and the key stages um, in the process. Um, and there, I divide that into, into four. Um, the concept meeting, the pre-application, the firm application, and then rate lock and closing. And we're gonna talk about the timeline and, and the key parts of, of each and how we can make each one of those as efficient as possible. Um, and so the first stage in the HUD process is, is what's called a concept meeting. And that is the opportunity for you um, as the developer um, and your project team and your lender to go sit down with HUD and present the project um, and, and answer any questions and address any items that, that HUD is concerned about upfront. Um, it's really the first step in the process and there's no cost associated with doing this, but um, we found that concept meetings are, are extremely productive and, and really get everybody, both the developer, the lender and HUD on the same page with regard to expectations um, and timing. Um, prior to the, the COVID pandemic, these were all in-person meetings. Um, they're usually held via Teams these days just because the scheduling is a little bit easier with the HUD staff um, and their office schedule. Um, but to, to put together a concept package and request a meeting, um, your lender is going to ask you for uh, a handful of pieces of information, which includes your initial loan analysis, so your, your lender's sizing and analysis of the loan, um, and then a, a narrative write-up package on the project that talks about um, the development team, the location, the site, um, environmental conditions, um, and the market um, to give an overall preliminary presentation um, of the development. The focus of these meetings tends to be um, environmental, market, and development team. And so it is really helpful um, at the concept stage if there's a phase one environmental report available or a preliminary market study. Um, and you know, a phase one can be a few years old, it can be a handful of years old, or it can be recently obtained. But just having an environmental report that addresses the site conditions um, goes a long way in sort of driving the discussion with HUD. Um, and then a preliminary market study as well. Um, we work with a number of vendors, including our partners at Colliers, um, to put together a preliminary market analysis that gives some preliminary demand and absorption conclusions um, to put in front of the HUD staff. Um, well, neither of those items are required, we find that it makes the process a lot easier and a lot more efficient um, to go into HUD with some demand numbers. Um, it's possible that if you've been through the process before and you've maybe had a concept meeting with HUD, you've sat down and, and somebody on, at the HUD office has expressed skepticism about the market or you know made blanket statements of, well, there's an awful lot of construction there. And having a market study that that shows exactly what's being what's under construction, what's being proposed, um, and what's in the planning stages relative to market growth is significant and really impactful for minimizing that amount of discussion and getting past any sort of market concerns to get to a positive conclusion um, from that meeting. Um, once we've had the meeting, which normally lasts an hour, um, HUD will issue a letter within five to seven days that either encourages the project to move forward or discourages the project from moving forward. And, and in the encouragement letter, HUD will identify the specific items they want addressed in the next stage of the application. And having that letter is helpful because it, it lets you know and your lender know what sort of the hot button items are. And if we can address those items thoroughly in the next stage, that makes the processing of that next stage application um, and HUD's review of that next stage application um, a lot easier and more expedited. It sort of helps us address potential roadblocks ahead of time. Um, and as I mentioned, there's no cost to have a concept meeting. So aside from any third parties that, that might be engaged in advance of that meeting. Uh, but 
that concept stage sort of culminates with that encouragement letter. Um, and then we're off to the races on the next step. And so the next step is the pre-application. And the pre-application is an appraisal, a market study, um, the phase one and the HUD environmental review submission. Those are the key items along with a bit of limited due diligence. Um, we do have to have schematic drawings at that stage. Um, so that you know HUD can see what the proposed unit types are. You want to have a good handle on the on the unit mix and the overall design of the building. So again, working with your architect on the timing for you know essentially a, an SD set or a design development set that will give you a, a good unit mix and site layout is really important. Um, it typically takes about 45 days to get those third party reports. Um, and if the due diligence is submitted in a timely fashion, um, typically we can get a pre a pre application submitted to HUD within 45 to 60 days of kicking off that process. Now, if you've done a HUD loan before, or you've you've not done one but but heard about a HUD loan before, you you've maybe heard about paperwork and due diligence requirements. Um, you know, being a government agency, HUD does have. Um, forms that need to be completed, and they and they do have a fairly robust due diligence checklist. Um, but working with a capable and experienced lender um, really makes that process a lot easier. Um, at Collier's Mortgage, we will take your organizational chart for your mortgage or entity and fill out the forms for you as much as possible, with the goal being having a due diligence package to you that you can review sign and make any comments or changes on rather than just sending you a, a bunch of forms and asking you to fill them out. It's like it's like the difference between trying to do your own taxes um, and having somebody help do your taxes. It, it makes a makes a big difference the you know the lender you use and the and the willingness to put together that due diligence for you. And that makes that process much easier, especially if you don't have a a significant staff or pool of analysts at your um, at your office to be collecting that due diligence. Um, once we submit that application to HUD, HUD has 60 days to review and issue uh, what's called an invitation letter. Um, that invitation letter that HUD issues um, will set forth the approved rents and expenses for the project. And so that letter is HUD's approval essentially of your income and expense underwriting. So they've signed off on the project, they've signed off on the income and expenses, and they're sub inviting you to submit a firm application. So you have pretty good comfort at the point of receiving an invitation that that project is going to move forward. I think something like 98 or 99 percent of projects that receive a, a invitation letter um, end up receiving a firm commitment. And those that don't are projects that have very significant changes in either the project, the team, or market conditions between invitation letter and firm application submission. Um, and then the cost of submitting the, the firm application is, a, is in addition to the third party reports, um, a fee to HUD, it's half of your HUD exam fee, which is HUD's application fee, and that's 15 basis points of the mortgage. Um, the next step in the process is the firm application. And the firm application is really the critical path in overall timing. And I want to be clear that during the entire process, whether it's the concept meeting or the pre-application, we're also working toward the firm application submission. And we're doing that because the driver of the timing of the firm application is your plans and specs and your construction pricing and the lender's third-party review of those items. And so we can start that third-party review as soon as those plans and specs hit what we sort of define as an 80 to 90% completeness level, um, uh, which includes you know, your civil, your structural, your MEP. But we can get that review started early and, and an experienced architect firm we'll know what that level is um, and, and when those plans and specs are ready for meaningful review by the third party vendor. And so when we talk about timing, 
we've had a, a number of projects where if everybody has been working on a schedule, we have submitted the firm application within a week or two of receiving the pre-application invitation letter. It can take a lot longer than that, depending on your on your design timeline, on your entitlement timeline, on your construction pricing. But if you have a team that's all working on a schedule um, that's that's been vetted and, and everyone's on board, um, you can cut that time fairly significantly. Um, and so the key items on the on the firm application are, as I mentioned, the art cost review, um, depending on the the timing relative to the pre-app, HUD might require a, an updated appraisal and market study. Um, you do have to have title survey and entitlement approval in hand. Um, you don't need a building permit, but you do need your zoning approval. Um, it's at the firm application stage that we are submitting a, a mortgage credit analysis on the borrower and the contractor. Um, and as I mentioned, the critical path is the architecture and cost review. Um, HUD has another 60 days to process the firm application. Um, generally, we find that the closer to the in issuance of the invitation letter that the firm application is submitted, the less of that 60 days HUD is, HUD is going to take to process the application because it's fresh in the underwriter's mind. <coughs> Excuse me, there haven't been material changes to the project or the market, um, and that makes that processing a lot easier. Um, and from a cost perspective, um, you submit the second half of the exam fee um, to HUD at the submission of the firm application. The culmination of the firm application process is that HUD issues a firm commitment, which is HUD's commitment to provide mortgage insurance for the project. Um, and with that commitment, um, you can proceed to rate lock and closing. The commitment is good for 60 days, but can be extended up to 120 days. So you really have a total of 180 days from the issuance of the firm commitment to closing. Um, however, generally, once you've locked the interest rate, that will set your closing timeline on a sort of a 60 to 90 day window. Um, and once you and your lender agree, um, and, and everybody's ready to go out to market, um, the lender will go out and sell that security in the secondary market. So Collier's Mortgage is, is an approved Ginny May issuer, so we will we will go rate lock that loan directly for you. Um, and we lock the rate for both the construction and the permanent phase. Um, in today's market, there are both single rate structures and split rate structures available. So um, a single rate structure might look something in today's market, like um, you know, five seventy-five as a as an interest rate for both the construction period um, and the permanent period, um, based on current market conditions. Um, under a split rate scenario, you might have a you might have a higher construction period interest rate, say ten or eleven percent, but then the trade off is a lower permanent um, phase interest rate, um, which is important because it's that permanent interest rate that's used for the calculation of the mortgage amount based on debt service coverage. And so what we're finding in today's market is sometimes that increase in, or very oftentimes that increase in mortgage amount um, with the lower uh, permanent phase rate um, more than offsets the increase in interest from the higher construction phase rate. But that's something that your lender will work closely with you um, and advise you about based on the specific economics of a deal. Um, once the rate's locked, we submit the draft closing package to HUD. Um, HUD will schedule closing within 30 business days of that package. And then you're off and running with construction within 10 days of closing. Um, and so that in, in a nutshell is the 221 D4 process. Um, obviously there's, there's a lot of steps in the process um, and a lot of stages, but you know, Early on in the process, we find it's really a best practice to get everybody on a call um, and really understand everybody's schedule. So we'll ask for the developer's project schedule. We'll ask for the architect's schedule. Um, oftentimes that's in the form of a, a Gantt or a PERT chart or something. And we'll ask for the contractor schedule if you've got a contractor identified. And we'll put together for you an overall deal timeline to make sure that we're putting 
application submission milestones, third party report dates, due diligence due dates um, in a schedule to help um, you know drive an overall timeline and the timeline that we can meet. And so um, in doing that, you know, we often find that, you know, if, if as I mentioned, if, if everybody's working on a, on a diligent schedule, this process from start to finish can can take can take as, as little as nine to 10 months. Um, you know, important to note if you've done a HUD deal in the past few years um, or particularly in the southeast region. Um, during the COVID pandemic, HUD's volume was very significant and, and they received more applications than they were able to process. And so HUD had an application queue at the time. Um, and that queue added 30 to 60 days of processing time to each stage because a deal would wait in HUD's queue until an underwriter was able to pick it up. Um, those queues don't exist anymore. Um, you know, the HUD will, uh, the folks in Washington will take credit for clearing the queue. Um, the reality is the, the market did that for HUD. The, uh, the cost and interest to make rate market took care of the queue. Um, but there isn't one today, and there's not going to be one for, for quite some time, which means HUD is picking up your deal as soon as the lender is submitting it to them. And so horror stories you've heard about applications sitting at HUD for 90 days and not being looked at. Um, that that's really a thing of the past, and and HUD is very efficiently working on these applications. Um, quick sort of overview of just you know when when fees and costs are are due in the process. Everyone's always curious about that. Um, you know the lender will invoice you for the third party reports um, when those are engaged, um, and so when you engage an appraisal or a market study or your environmental. Um, the lender will bill you for those reports. Um, in addition, um, if the lender is coordinating any of the, the third party green MIP items, um, they'll bill for those um, up front as well. But until you've submitted an application to HUD, um, the only costs you're incurring are the costs of the third party reports. Um, as I mentioned, you submit an exam fee or, or HUD's application fee. Um, you pay that to HUD um, at the time of the application submission. So at each application submiss submission to HUD, you're incurring a portion of that application fee. Um, HUD charges an inspection fee um, that's paid at closing out of mortgage proceeds. Um, and then your, your financing costs are going to be paid at closing. And so, you know, your lender will work with you to sort of identify what funds are at risk um, in what stage of the process, but it is incremental for you to make decisions along the way as to submissions to HUD and payment of those fees to HUD. So, um, one item I've talked about a um, few different times today, and I want to get into a little more detail on is, is what's called the green MIP. And so, in 2016, HUD came out with a lower mortgage insurance premium rate to incentivize development to third party green standards. And that lower MIP rate um, is very significant, especially on market rate transactions. I, I think since the green MIP came out, um, all but one of the projects that we have financed at Collier's and, and formerly Doherty through the D4 program took advantage of the green MIP. And the reason for that is because it reduces the MIP from 65 basis points to 25 basis points annually. So that's 40 basis points of cost savings. And that MIP goes into the debt service constant calculation to calculate your mortgage. So a lower MIP not only has lower ongoing costs, um, but it also allows for uh, a higher mortgage amount, which is meaningful to projects in today's market. To meet the green MIP, um, the project needs to be designed and built to a HUD approved third party green standard. Um, and there are about 13 or 14 on HUD's list. Um, the by far the most commonly used are LEED um, and National Green Building Standard. Um, I think uh, I think I would say probably 95 percent of our green MIP projects have used LEADER and GBS. Um, about 75% of those have used NGBS with the remaining portion um, using LEED. 
typically the lead projects were either higher rise buildings or projects in more urban areas where it was a, a requirement of the building code. But you know what we're finding is most building codes are pretty similar to the requirements for national green building standard. And so any incremental cost in designing to that standard um, in achieving that certification um, really are, are not meaningful and more than offset by the reduction um, in the MIP on an ongoing basis. So the, the cost savings um, and the payback period, cost savings is significant, payback period is very short. Um, so really the, the, the onus for the green MIP is, is on the design team. Um, and, uh, you know, an experienced design firm likely has somebody in-house or a consultant that is able to, to, to meet those certifications and work with you on that process. Um, and, and it makes it a lot easier if, if that's the case, uh, um, because really then the main firm application requirements coordinated by the lender are a SETI um, or a Statement of Energy Design Intent. Um, and that's a modeling exercise through the EPA's portfolio portfolio manager tool. Um, HUD requires a score of 75 or better. Um, if you're designing to a third party green standard, your score is going to be well above 90. Um, and then a data collection plan, which identifies how you're going to collect utility data on an ongoing basis. Uh, most of the time on a new build, that's going to be a master meter. Um, before the uh, before the utilities, uh, the, the gas and electric go out to separate unit meters, that's generally the most cost effective way to do it. Um, and, and that helps for the ongoing requirements, um, which is an annual submission of a statement of energy performance or a SEP, which takes your whole building utility data, runs it through the EPA's portfolio manager, um, and you need to score 75 or higher on an ongoing um, on an annual basis as well. Again, it shouldn't be difficult if, if you've met those design requirements. Um, and a key item for the green MIP is just involving your architect and consultant early. Um, you know, and, and a lender is going to ask for information um, if you're using one of the standards um, and, and really, you know, can articulate with the design team what those requirements are early on. But getting ahead of the green MIP and, and being purposeful about it from the outset makes it a much easier process than getting to the firm application submission um, and realizing that you don't have the, the energy items needed for the green MIP. So again, a, a, an experienced development team goes a long way on that front. Um, and this next slide is just to, to illustrate some of the examples of projects um, that we've been involved in um, that through the 221D4 program recently. And this shows sort of the variety of, of, of executions that can be done. Um, you know, Calebra Road Apartments is a, is a new construction low-income housing tax credit project. Um, the Draper is a new construction market rate project. Um, Sherman Forbes is an acquisition rehab of a Section 8 project using tax exempt bonds and low-income housing tax credits. Um, and then Zenith is the conversion of a uh, of a, a historic high school into market rate apartments using historic tax credits. So a lot of different ways the HUD programs can be used. Um, we spent a good amount of time talking about the D4, and uh, while that's sort of the, the focus of the presentation, I did want to talk about the 223F as well, um, and that is HUD's acquisition and refinance program. Um, candidly, it's very, very little used for acquisition, um, just because those those timelines are a little bit short. And even though HUD can close in four to six months, um, typically a seller is not giving a buyer that much time. Um, if you've, if it's been a little while since you've done a HUD 223F, you may be familiar with something called the three-year rule. Um, and the three-year rule stated that um, in order to refinance a project with HUD, um, a project needed to be three years from the date of its certificate of occupancy. Um, in 2020, um, immediately before the COVID pandemic, HUD rescinded the three-year rule. Um, that rescinding of the three-year rule got sort of got overshadowed by what happened over the next year and a half. Um, but 
HUD is able now to refinance conventionally financed um, properties um, once they've hit stabilization without having to wait for three years, um, which is very significant and made HUD a great tool for a project that may be under construction right now or may have conventional financing that you're far down the road on, but your goal is ultimately long-term fixed rate, fully amortizing finance. The F is a great option there. Um, it is a 35-year term in amortization. Um, HUD will finance up to 85% of value. Um, it drops to 80 if you're taking cash out. Um, and HUD will underwrite a 118 debt service coverage ratio. Um, green MIP also um, is applicable for a 223F refinance on a market rate project. It takes that MIP from 60 basis points down to 25 basis points. So again, a meaningful savings. Um, if you are designing a project to use conventional financing, but are planning for a HUD takeout, um, the design team is still really important because if you want to use that green MIP, you really want to design and build that project to a third party green standard. And you also, it's very helpful to have an architect that is familiar with HUD's requirements, because even if you're not doing the construction loan with HUD, Having a project that's fully designed to Fair Housing, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and the Green MIP makes that refinance project a lot easier. Um, you would be surprised how many projects, even in today's market, are built um, that don't meet the Federal Fair Housing Act. And so having a, a designer that is, that is really on top of those requirements um, goes a long way when you go to refinance. Um, and the 223F process takes about four to six months um, from start to finish. Um, and really that process um, is driven by um, third party reports. Um, so it's an appraisal, a phase one and a capital needs assessment. Um, those take about 30 to 45 days. HUD has 45 days to, um, to review the application and issue a firm commitment. And then it takes about 30 days to close from there. So that's where the four to six month time frame comes from. A um, couple key items is to submit a firm application for a 223F, you need to have one month of stabilized operations supporting the loan amount. So for a newly built project, the refinance will be underwritten based on a, a stabilized appraisal NOI. And so HUD will want to see that you have one month of actual operations that supports that loan amount at a 1.1765 times debt service coverage. And then you need three months of consecutive similar operations to close. Um, and so when we're working on a refinance for a newly built project, um, we like to get involved early, even before that stabilization has hit. So we can be tracking monthly operations against um, the stabilized pro forma to help advise when it makes sense to engage those third party reports so we don't lose any time waiting for third parties and application due diligence and are in a position to submit as soon as the project hits that one month of operations because we know most people want to get out of their construction loans as soon as possible. Um, HUD does allow cash out. Um, there's, there's a little bit less of that in today's market, but HUD will allow cash out. Um, if your project was built within the last year um, and you, you haven't hit six consecutive months of the stabilized debt service coverage, HUD will hold some of that cash out until you hit the, the, um, the six consecutive months. Um, HUD will now allow repairs up to about $50,000 a unit um, to be included in a 223F. Um, we call that the heavy F. Um, that's mostly for value add acquisitions or low income housing tax credit projects, but that's a significant improvement over the, the previous requirements. Um, and then again, the 223F is a non recourse loan. Um, so uh, important as you're looking at long term financing options. Um, and then just a handful of, of representative transactions as well. Um, this represents both market rate, newly built projects that we refinanced with HUD, as well as low income housing tax credit projects and existing projects. So 
um, just existing, uh, you know, projects between five and 20 years old, great candidates for the HUD program as well. Um, and then before we stop and open for questions, I uh, wanted to summarize with some of the advantages of the HUD programs. Um, and obviously, I think the first pro, uh, first advantage is that uh, it is non-recourse. Um, and as we've mentioned, uh, longest fixed rate fully, ex fully amortizing option available. Um, lowest interest rates available in the market, um, lowest underwritten debt service coverage, um, highest underwritten loan to value typically in the market. Um, and 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 as a result of of the follow of of all of that and the government guarantee and the Ginnie Mae security, um, it allows the uh, the interest rates uh, to be to be extremely low with that Ginnie Mae security. Um, in addition, and what's really important to bring up in, in times of high interest rates like we're in today, is that HUD does have two easy mechanisms um, to reduce that interest rate. Uh, the first is a 223A7 A refinance, and the second is an interest rate modification. Um, and the modification is the easiest of those two. And essentially what it does is it allows the lender to reset the interest rate on your loan while keeping the the outstanding terms the same. Um, that typically works if the rate in the market um, decreases between 150 and 200 basis points from the rate on your loan. Um, and I will tell you that between the beginning of 2020 and the beginning of 2022, um, we modified or refinanced almost every loan in our HUD portfolio using one of those two options, generating fairly significant debt service savings. So. Um, the way I look at interest rates on a HUD loan is you're locking the upper bound of that rate um, today. Um, and then finally, the loan is fully assumable as well. So we are seeing a lot of HUD loans actually be assumed in today's market. Rates that have, you know, start with a three or a four today are very appealing um, for buyers to assume that existing financing. And so we're processing a lot of transfer of physical assets on behalf of our, our clients and, and new buyers of those projects with HUD. Um, one other item I want to bring up is HUD did recently change their um, surplus cash distribution requirements. So it used to be that you could only take surplus cash once a year with an annual audit or twice a year if you did a mid-year cash calculation. Um, HUD has eased up on those requirements um, to now allow for monthly distributions with an annual reconciliation with the audit. Um, the only caveat is to qualify for monthly distributions, you have to have had previous successful HUD experience, so you can't have any significant flags with HUD. And if a, a deal is your first HUD deal, um, HUD will require the semi-annual distributions for the first year before switching to monthly. But the monthly distribution change is, is a meaningful one for a lot of borrowers and has actually driven a lot of developers that were previously not interested in using HUD to the HUD program. So something to consider as well. Um, a con always to point out is, is the time frame, but as we've talked about, um, you know, there are there are ways to streamline that and, and an experienced team is the is the key item in that. Um, as well as sort of the paperwork requirements. Um, you know, working with, as I mentioned, a, a lender that's able to assist you as much as possible with the due diligence and the paperwork makes that process um, extremely, you know, extremely streamlined and, and a lot easier for you and your team as you're working through it. Um, and with that, Matt, that brings me to sort of the end of the prepared presentation. Um, I'm not sure if you got any questions during the chat, um, if you had any or, or anybody wanted to ask, but I do really appreciate the opportunity and, and time to talk to everybody today. Well, Mike, that was a that was an excellent presentation. Um, I, I did not see any questions. I do want to I do want to open it up for questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A um, and I can ask them of Mike. Um, in the meantime, I did you know, uh, want to say uh, couple of the takeaways that I got were the flexibility that that HUD has. It, it seems like the process is reasonably non, it could be nonlinear. You know, in other words, you might start the project one way um, or a fully developed project uh, could be repositioned. Um, that there was a lot of cash available to to do some creative things there. 
Um, also, this idea, I don't know if you have uh, some more thoughts on this idea that you talked about. Um, a lot of our developers are more familiar with it than I am, but the idea of the, the takeout loan and also the, the builder's premium, the builder's risk. Um, so this risk mitigation aspect of, of HUD um, seems to be really uh, aware of you know a lot of the pain and struggles in the market. So if you could maybe revisit a little bit about some creativity around um, the the um, switching from the construction loan to the permanent loan, uh, but that was that was one of the big takeaways for me. Yeah, absolutely, and and really, I mean, in, in today's market, you know, we're aware that that you know, developers are in a lot of cases, you know, sort of having trouble getting out of their construction loan. Um, that that loan may have been underwritten um, with an interest rate stress that sort of didn't account for what has happened in today's market. And so the 223F has been helpful there because when compared to other executions, the F generally wins on proceeds, which either minimizes the cash that a developer might need to put in to pay off their construction loan um, or or even make that cash neutral. But what I think is a really important selling point of the D4 is that you have the construction and permanent loan built into one. So there is no conversion test. You don't have to sort of make sure that your project hit pro forma in order to refinance that loan out, or you're not subject to whatever volatility there is in the market um, that occurs between the time you start construction and the time you refinance out, which which may be in reality a two, three, four year period. And so, you know, we're sort of, you know, industry folks will say we're sort of in a period of the cash in refinance, which hasn't existed for a long time. But um, doing a D4 minimizes that, you know, takes out the risk that you have to do a cash in refinance after construction. Um, and the 223F for projects that are already under construction is going to help pay off that construction loan by generating the maximum possible proceeds. Awesome. I do have a question here, um, kind of around the idea of, of of the interest in the 221 D4. Um, have you seen an uptick in the 221 D4 interest um, or applications lately? And if so, how significant has that been? Yeah, great question. And, and the answer is yes. Um, and and really, we, we've seen, you know. We've seen interest from a lot of sources. I mean, number one, sort of your traditional HUD borrowers that have been historically used to using the HUD program. Um, we've seen developers that are new to the HUD program sort of, you know, approaching the, you know, starting a project, um, you know, from even the, the site plan and, and concept stage, um, looking at HUD because of certainty of execution. Um, maybe available time, um, not as much of a race to get in the ground, but rather wanting to wanting to take advantage of the of the benefits of the program that I've talked about. So we're seeing a lot of developers new to the HUD program starting um, from scratch. But then we're also seeing a handful of projects that uh, you know, or an uptick in projects that are maybe already fully designed or are maybe at an eighty percent um, plan level and that are coming to us saying, hey, I know I know HUD's maybe going to take a little bit longer based on where I'm at, but my, my typical construction lender, whether that's a regional bank, a, a larger bank, is either not in the market or um, the terms they're offering me right now are you know, creating too much of a, a, an equity gap for me. And, and I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to start the HUD process midstream. And so we're seeing an uptick in interest in HUD from sort of all three of those sources. Awesome. I, I don't know if um, if we highlighted this earlier or not, but you also mentioned on previous calls that the uh, the size of, of what's considered to be a, a large HUD loan has been revised upward. Um, do you want to mention that or? Yeah, yeah, good, great, great point. So um, until about a little over a year ago, um, HUD's parameter for what they called a large loan was 75 million. Um, and when you're considered a large loan, the leverage um, decreases to 75% of cost and the debt service coverage increases to 130. Um, HUD recently increased that to 120 million with an annual index. 
And so it is actually indexed once already. So now the large loan threshold is 125 million before you hit those thresholds. So, um, you know, you're underwriting a 118 cover, um, 85% loan to cost for loans all the way up to 125 million, which was a, you know, obviously a significant improvement. Um, the other thing that HUD did away with in the last few years is the three-year ownership test to recognize land equity. And so, while not a lot of loans are, are limited by cost in today's market, um, HUD will give you credit in the cost basis for equity you have in the land. Um, you know, some more conventional sources are looking at cash equity particularly, and they're looking at your basis. But, you know, if you have a site that you've owned for 10 years, and has appreciated significantly, HUD is going to use that market value um, today in the basis for the the for the the loan calculation, not your not your acquisition cost. Yeah, that's a huge um, huge point right there. Is there anything else that we should know about the loan to value um, changes? Or is that the that's the big one though, right? The land. That, that's that's the big one. You know, in, in a you know, in lower interest rate environments, we're typically highlighting the the sort of levers that you can pull on the cost front to to maximize that cost based mortgage. And if you've done a HUD deal before, you're familiar with BISPRA. Um, that's Builder and Sponsors Profit and Risk Allowance. It's essentially a 10 percent boost in the HUD replacement cost. Um, it's a non cash boost to that cost. But if you're able to structure an ownership where your general contractor has some skin in the game, um, that's able to to maximize the mortgage. So in an environment where loans are not constrained by debt service coverage, it would be conceivable that a HUD loan, you could have a, a HUD loan that has a minimal cash requirement if you had both land equity and BISPRA included. That's awesome. Well, we're coming up to one o'clock. I, I don't see any other questions. Um, Mike, I just want to thank you again for your time and, and wealth of knowledge. And I want to thank all of the guests that uh, found time today to to join us. Really appreciate it. Any closing comments you want to say, Mike? Or No, but just uh, just wanted to say thank you again to, to Matt, David and the, and the whole team at uh, at CBA for the for the invitation, um, and and to Beth Bellner, one of our, our really experienced correspondents as well. I know she's on the call, but just really appreciate the time. And please don't hesitate to follow up with any questions. My my contact info is on the screen, and uh, just appreciate the time and opportunity. Great. Yes, and we'll make uh we'll make the slide presentation available in a kind of a follow up thank you email to everybody. Is that fair? Yes. Works great for me. All right, great. Well, thank everyone. Have a uh, have a great Wednesday, and uh, hopefully, we'll talk to you all soon. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody.